I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield. I am going to stay on the battlefield until I stay on the battlefield until I die. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to trust the Lord. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2023 lecture series, The Founders Day, being hosted here at St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church, where the Reverend Dr. William Nathaniel Barnes Jr. is the pastor. Uh, the Reverend Fran Barnes is the co laborer and spouse. Uh, fine people of St. Paul have done a fantastic job. If you missed it, that's your fault. Nudge your neighbor and say, maybe you must stay awake. The program has been already identified. We want to thank also our viewers and viewers on uh, Facebook and whatever avenue that they're listening to. As we come to have words and part of the lecturer and I will uh, allow the uh, presenter to tell us who that's going to be. Uh, but we want to welcome you. Enjoy your the challenge is to make sure that you uh, we got to partner off. You know, you, you, when we, we were in a school, you used to you know partner up with somebody. Okay, the person next to you, you left or right, that's your partner. Uh, your challenge is to make sure that your partner does not fall asleep. Amen. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty, gracious, supreme, and awesome God, here we are once again in your divine presence in the sanctuary to tell you thank you one more time. Thank you for what our eyes have already seen and our ears have already heard and our hearts have already felt. Thank you for the worship services earlier today and the powerful word that was deposited into our spirits. And now, God, we just thank you once again for how good you have been to us since last Founders Day to this present moment. But not only, God, do we thank you for that. We thank you for our rich heritage and our rich history. We thank you that we are not only AMEs, but we are African Americans. And we thank you, God, for the strength, the skills, the abilities, and all that you have given us as a race of people to accomplish and be who we are in your name. So, God, we thank you for the anointings you placed on our lives. We thank you for how you blessed us. We thank you for how you brought us from slavery to freedom. We thank you for how you brought us out of the outhouse all the way to the White House. We thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy because if it had not been for you uh, we don't know where we would be and what we would do uh, you've healed our bodies uh, glory to God you've educated our children uh, we thank you
you, God. We thank you for the YPDs that are in the house. We thank you for what you're going to do this Black History Weekend. But right now, God, we thank you for our bishop. We thank you for our supervisor. We thank you for our lecturer this afternoon, God. We thank you for the wisdom you deposited to him and the knowledge. So let us glean from what you have for us this afternoon that will help us to be better men and women, boys and girls, that we may continue to represent you in your kingdom. And God, when it's all said and done, we're going to tell you thank you from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. We're going to tell you thank you for what you did for us last night and tonight. We're going to thank you, God, for for what you're going to do for us as we travel back to our various places. We're going to thank you, God, for the knowledge that we have gained, that we may be able to be better men and women in this kingdom and in this world. So thank you, God, for all that we honor you for. Bless us coming in and bless us going out. We're always ahead and never the tail always above and never beneath because you are Jehovah Jireh you are our provider and we thank you it is in the mighty name of Jesus somebody say amen thank you Jesus Holy Spirit you are welcome in this lecture you are welcome in the atmosphere you are welcome in every vessel you are welcome right now in the name of Jesus we pray Amen, amen, and amen. Tell your neighbor, he's welcome in my sanctuary. Let the church say amen. amen. Selected scripture, John 15. I said you all will come in. First five verses of John 15, the word of the Lord. While every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The word of God for the people of God. To the established protocol, it is my honor as well as my great privilege to present our great and phenomenal leader. On July the 10th, 2021, the Episcopal Committee of the AME Church assigned the Right Reverend Frank Madison Reed the third, the 130 of the AME Church as the presiding prelate of the electrifying, empowering 11th Episcopal District. Bishop Reed is a internationally known leader. He's an author, preacher, lecturer, motivational speaker, and community leader. Within the tradition of our church, I invite you now to stand as we greet our bishop, none other than the right 
Reverend Frank Madison Reed III. Will you put your blessed hands together for our leader? Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. To our tremendous Founders Day 2023 speaker who did such a tremendous job. Let's give it up for Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. I call her name intentionally because my wife sent me a text and said you did a tremendous introduction, but you never called her name. And so we've known each other back to the days of Shorter. Reverend Dr. Teresa Teresa Fry Brown. Let's give God another big hand for her. <clears throat> now as people continue to come in. It is my assignment today to be the lecturer. Uh, the lecturer originally was going to be uh, Dr. Earl, Earl Henderson, uh, who is a uh, world, is a political, a international political scholar whose most recent book is t uh, entitled uh, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised which is one of the most important books any African-American of any age can read in terms of this Sankofa moment, which we are seeking to become a Sankofa movement so that Sankofa miracles can take place. So that instead of having Black Heritage Weekends, we have them because we recognize that we are making history and her story. And so it becomes very important that we recognize that history is a living, living legacy that we must not only know, but that we must know and do. Therefore, our now rules for lectures. Uh, Dr. Cornell West and I, who were dear friends when we were at Harvard, we would argue all the time uh, because I would say, now Cornell, when you lecture, you're supposed to lecture. And when you preach, you're supposed to preach. And he said, well, I'm not a preacher, uh, but you know the spirit gets on me every now and then. I said, well, since you're a frustrated preacher, just remember to lecture until the spirit comes. And so since I am a preacher, uh, I will abide by the rules of lecture. And I would recommend that you take notes either on your, on your uh, iPhone, iPad, uh, I don't want to be a technologically limited, but whatever phone or pad that you have, because there are seeds that the Lord is going to spread today uh, that can transform and revolutionize your life. The title of the lecture is The Sankofa Movement. The Sankofa Movement. Seized S-E-I-Z-E-D, seized by the spirit of resistance, revolution, rebirth, and revival. The Sankofa movement, seized by the spirit of resistance, revolution, rebirth, and revival. The scriptural foundation of the lecture will come from um, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5a. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, Ephesus, Paul's letter where he says, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers 
and wickedness in high places. Ephesus, the place in Acts 19 where the spirit falls and great things uh, begin to happen. It is in Ephesus, Gardner Taylor's last series of sermons at the Concord Baptist Church of Jesus Christ came from the book of Ephesus, for he recognized that the church was about to enter into a period of time in which the principles and practices emerging from Ephesus needed to take place. And since we have a homiletics teacher, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones did a uh, famous English evangelical preacher that Dr. Taylor did not like to fact that I read his sermons, but D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, his last series of sermons at the Westminster Church in London on the book of Ephesus. To the angel of the church at Ephesus, to the pastors of the church at Ephesus, to the lay leaders of the church at Ephesus, write these things, says the holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. The lampstands, the seven stars represent the seven of the pastors, the seven the leaders, the seven leaders of the seven churches, who walk in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. The lampstand church because the church is supposed to be the last spread of light in this darkness. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear the work for evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored. For my name's sake, Jesus says, and have not come weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left, that you have forgotten your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. And then in the book you will hear me uh, quote from in a minute, the spirit is the ultimate source of culture. And it is culture as both Fanon, France Fanon, and Cabral, a revolutionary out of Guinea, acknowledge that spirit is the source of truly revolutionary action. And then Henry Clark, one of the elders of the Afrocentric movement, said, you cannot successfully oppress a consciously historical, pe historical people. Once a people know who they are, they will always know about their condition. The Sankofa movement, seized by the spirit of resistance, revolution, rebirth, and revival. Now, we are in Florida. The context of this lecture takes place in the state of Florida, where we have an anti-woke governor who believes he is the pharaoh of Florida and wants to be the pharaoh of the, of the United States of America. In an article written by one of the top uh, New York Times op-ed writers, Charles Blow, uh, after discussion with your bishop, the final paragraph in that article talks about how I warned Brother Blow, don't underestimate the governor because he has a wicked wisdom. He has a wicked wisdom. And so to put San, the Sankofa movement that the AME Church represents 
and manifested here in Florida, I want to share with you a quote from Laborers in the Vineyard of the Lord, the beginnings of the AME Church in Florida, 1865 to 1895. If you don't have this book, you should, not just to have it, but to read it. February 1895 constituted a major turning point for Florida's AME Church, at least in a symbolic sense and contrary to anyone's expectations at the time. Given the institution's position in the African-American community, not to mention in the state as a whole, the date marked the end of a remarkable age and the commencement of a distinctly different era. In the 30 years leading up to 1895, from 1865 to 1895, the AME Church, somebody say, that's our church. The AME Church in Florida had proved itself the single most effective organizational force for Florida's black residents. It did not say black Methodists. It did not say black Baptists. It said for the black residents of the entire state. Having brought comfort and inspiration to thousands of its members, the church had also demonstrated its capability to rock Florida's political balance of power. In the early years, it nearly had succeeded in seizing the control of the state's government. Everybody say Sankofa. And so we are here today to have a Sankofa moment that becomes a Sankofa movement so that we can have Sankofa miracles, not only in the church, but politically, culturally, economically, technologically, because when you know who you are, and what you have done, Sankofa moment means, Sankofa movement means, do it again, God. Turn to your neighbor and say, do it again, God. And so in the book from which the title comes from of our lecture, the Sankofa movement, the re-African, re-Africanization mm, re and the reality of war. This is not written by Christian brothers and sisters. They are uh, uh, pu racially pu racial purists who have what Dr. Uh, Earl uh, would call um, reactionary si reverse civilizationism. In other words, they do not believe that anything good can come out of African-American culture. They believe that the American has corrupted the African. But Professor Earle has proven and established that when one looks at the great contributions of African Americans, I'll come to that in a, more, in, in a minute, from the book Born Black. Somebody say, I'm glad I was born in blackness. Because in the book Born, born in Blackness, it makes the case that America and Europe would not be what they have been since the, four, since the um, 13th, yeah, 13th, no, 14th, 14th century, because they all of their wealth, all of their knowledge came out of Africa. Not just the slaves, the gold came out of Africa. Look at your cell phone. To keep your cell phone going, all of the basic materials that are needed to make your phone run comes out of Africa. And so after what 
the European did was go to Africa, rape Africa, Lord have mercy, and if I had time, I won't do it, I'll just mention this book. What, what here in the Sankofa movement, they are, they are criticizing as Christianity is in fact whiteianity. There is a difference between Christianity and the white interpretation of Christianity. And so Dr. F uh, Dr. Cone, not Cecil, Dr. well, Cecil got on his brother about it, all right? The fact is, how are you gonna have a black theology this, and it comes out of white European theologians? And so when one looks at Henry McNeil Turner, when one looks at Denmark Vesey, when one looks at Morris Brown, one sees that Sankofa for the African Methodist Episcopal Church means Sankofa for the black community in, in America and in the Caribbean. Because when you have the Sankofa mo moment, you recognize that you were born in black. Good God from Zion. And when you're born in blackness, you understand that hip-hop is not new. That hip-hop emerged from the black church. If you want to talk about hooping, then let me take you from hooping to Muhammad Ali because Muhammad Ali was rapping way back when. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. All right? Rumble, young man, rumble. He was rapping even back then. Somebody say born in blackness. And so what is Sankofa? It is important let, that we, let me make sure I stay on time. It is important that we recognize what Sankofa is. Understanding this comes from the Sankofa movement, understanding our historical condition, and thereafter mobilizing for sub substantive personal and collective development, are needs and undertakings that must be given the highest priority at this juncture in the history of the African world. Sankofa, go back and retrieve which, that which was lost. Sankofa, an expression of renewal and restoration and God's order, a cultural, ideological framework that is designed to address these needs. Sankofa means to recover that which was lost. Everybody say Sankofa means to recover that which was lost. The book of First Samuel and discover what happens when David, who was a gangbanger at the time, had when they So he, t he spoke to the Lord. He put Sankofa involves the parallel process of rediscovery and 
of that history and the realization that those related cultural dynamics imperatives for survival, development, and expansion. We have used Sankofa to characterize this era in the cycle of African history, an era of rediscovery and reclamation and rebuilding of our cultural reality and the beginning of, a, of that broad and intergenerational process of re-Africanization, or might I change that for our context, to re-Africanize re the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Now, born in blackness, Africa, Africans, and the making of the modern world, 1471 to the Second World War. It was the Second World War that brought America to the forefront and began the end of the Cold War. In this study, we discover that our brother points out that the American Revolution was really as much a black revolution as it was a white revolution. He points out that the Civil War was a war by the South to maintain slavery, and the war by, uh, for, uh, of, of the North so they could preserve slavery in the North as well as the South. And so what happened? There was a, the North couldn't win, the South couldn't win, until black soldiers came in and won the war. So the first revolution in America, long before the uh, Panthers talked about picking up the gun, long before the deacons of defense, was when between 150 and 3,000 black men joined the Union Army and defeated the South. So the Civil War was really a revolution, and now white folk are calling for a civil, quote unquote, race war, because they realize that it was black people that helped win the war against the South in the first place, and so they're beginning to try and put us back in our place. Somebody say Sankofa. And we have become, if you don't mind th this for a minute, we have become so comfortable in our pews and so comfortable as, our, as pastors because with some of us are doing well, dressing well, and living well, that we forgot the fact that while we're doing well, the majority of our people are moving backwards instead of forwards. And so it is true, perhaps preachers have become pimps and the devil is in the pulpit instead of the Holy Spirit in the church. Can I get a witness? Because like people, like, pe like leaders, so are the people. If you have an apathetic, mediocre pastor who is all about getting it for themselves and being on, being on television so that they can get on the Joy Reid show and get a little money and the, while the people have... Did you hear them figures she gave today? How many black people are without health insurance? Somebody say Sankofa. And so if Sankofa is recovering what we lost, we got to do more than ask for reparations. We've got to do more than ask for the George Floyd Justice Act. We've got to demand that what you owe us for saving your democracy every time it is about to be messed up is more than a few dollars. You owe us equal leadership in every area of business because when I remember what we have done for this country, uh-huh, somebody say Sankofa moment. I'm not begging you for the crumbs from your table. I want not only a seat at the table, I want as much power as anybody at the table for black people. Can I get a witness? 
Latino, Latinx folk, and they don't like the term Latinx folk, but that's the one the scholars say use. Latinx, the Latinx community is, they don't care. Let me put this this way. How many of y'all from South Florida? You know they're black Cubans, don't you? White Cubans got mad with Castro because Castro helped put black Cubans in power. So the reason they are anti-black in South Florida is because they understand that it was when black people get power, everybody gets power. Black power, feminism. Black power, LBG, LBGTQA. I, they had so many. I can't keep up with the initials. Uh, <laughs> Lord Jesus. Okay. We went through that, the NAACP. Uh, okay. <laughs> and so... The Sankofa moment is a fugitive pedagogy, all right? You've heard about, the, and that is teaching. The church, I must speak heresy for some of you. I'm not worried about the AP, Black Studies piece. I'm worried about why we are not teaching black history in our churches, why we are not teaching black history in many of our HBCUs that claim to be historically black but are not teaching black students how to be black doctors, black lawyers, and have an insight into the community. Somebody say fugitive pedagogy. I was, is Trey here? Where is Trey? Trey, do you recognize the name of Harry and Henrietta Moore? And didn't I see uh, a, a thing about a movie that was made, in, made about them in your church? Now listen to this. Harry and Henrietta Moore were married and both were school teachers as well as civil, right, act, civil rights activists in Florida. The Moors were fired in 1946 because of their activism surrounding equal pay for black teachers. Their home was bombed on Christmas in 1951 killing them both after their organizing to challenge the wrongful conviction of four young black men, one of whom was killed in police custody. Sankofa, the Sankofa movement is an educational movement. It is not education to know, it is education to do. And so, since my time is running out, waging a good war, Sankofa movement, revival. Doc in our sermon talked about folk saying, to God is dead. The church is dead, excuse me, that's what she said, the church is dead. I remember in 1966, on the cover of Time magazine, it said, God is dead. And the AME church was slipping, black churches were slipping, white churches were going out of business. But interestingly enough, in the 1970s, religious revival broke out in the white and black churches. Bishop John Richard Bryant was used by God as an instrument to bring revival to African Methodism. But what 
many of those who are second generation into that movement for God is that we were not neo-Pentecostal. It was that Bishop Bryant brought us back to the way black Methodists have always worshipped and always been in politics. Everybody say Sankofa. And so for those of you that are saying the church is dead, why is it dead? Because many of our pastors and people have accepted Western individualism. They have forgotten the essence of African religion, uh, African philosophy and religion by MBT, which says, I am because we are. And because we are, I am. So if the small pastor at a small church, there is no such thing as a small pastor, small church, but in terms of membership and finance, if they're down, then it's the role of the churches at the top to make sure not only that they have their stuff paid, but to make sure that they are able to grow. But what has happened now is I got mine, you get yours. Because a whole new generation is more individualistic and so our church is not united. Richard Allen, everybody say Sankofa. Richard Allen gave us a connectional church. And connection meant unified. Unified meant, my father taught me this. Many of you went to General Conference in Cincinnati. I believe that was 92. No, 2000. And the big debate uh, between Bishop Adams and uh, some of the so-called megachurches at the time was he wanted uh, the megachurches to pay 10% uh, of, of what they raised. That did not pass. But, every, but the districts where those churches existed, the second and the fifth got most of the budget. The Baltimore Annual Conference only had one church that had raised, at that time, over a million dollars. There was no empowerment then. Uh, Dr. Ann Farrell, uh, Lightner Fuller, the church had not yet grown to what it would be. And so we took the entire Baltimore Annual Conferences, which raised our budget from $11,000 every half to $60,000 every half. And my elder said, are you sure? I said, the other churches don't have it because Bethel was because the AME church is. Oh, God. It ain't hit you yet. Sankofa means sacrifice. Revival. It's resistance. Revolution, rebirth, and revival. And so how do we close? Waging a good war, a military history of the civil rights movement. And he makes the point that until there had been movements leading up to Montgomery, but those civil rights movements achieved some good things, but it was only when the black church got involved that stuff started happening. And here's what he says. The siege of Montgomery, otherwise known as the Montgomery bus boycott, marks the first major effort of the modern civil rights movement. The leaders and most of the participants certainly knew history was against them. But by the mid-1950s, they were better prepared than earlier generations. Here the pieces came together for the first time. The awakening Southern, Southern Black Church. What black, Southern Black Church? The awakening. That's why your governor want, doesn't want us to know our history. 
Because if we have a Sankofa moment, the next thing we'll do is have a Sankofa movement. And if we have a Sankofa movement, we're going to put that, well, anyway. And so here the pieces came together. The awakening to Southern Black Church, the returning black soldiers, indignant at being denied access to the democratic rights for which they had fought, and a population weary of subjugation and ready to act. The basis for action was organizing. As in the military, even before discipline, the all-important beginning point was how people were organized and trained. How people were organized and trained. These are the subjects that deserve far more attention in studies of the civil rights movement. How the people were organized and trained. Richard Allen took 13 people. She, she told the story. Upstairs in, in uh, what they called nigger heaven later was full of black people, but only 13 left. Now, of those 13, most of them were previously members also of the Free African Society. Somebody say, Sankofa movement. Free African Society, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Now, get this. When I went to Jerusalem and visited the Holocaust Museum there, the first thing you see when you walk in is never forget. Never forget what white supremacy did that demands a Sankofa movement is they, dis they deceived African people. They have deceived African American people, their system. Once there was deception the deception led to division, as in the Bible. He came for Eve, but where was Adam? In fact, God said, Adam, where art thou? Once you are deceived, it's easy to divide you. Keep that in mind as we move towards general conference uh, election of delegates. Once the people were deceived, they were divided. When they were divided, they were disrupted. And once they were disrupted, then the destruction of the people and the, and the souls of black folk were beginning to be destroyed. How does Sankofa change that? It moves from deception to deliverance. Deliverance. Remember the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Thou shalt have no other God before God. Uh-oh. All right. That's your deliverance. We've forgotten God. We've made people our God. We've made mobile phones our God. We have become distracted and have forgotten the God that brought us out. Now, if God brought you out of all of that, then why in the hell don't you think God will bring our children and grandchildren out of where we are now? But you got to have a Sankofa moment. Somebody say Sankofa moment. That is where our resistance comes from. After the deliverance, we must practice self-denial. Because self-denial means, Lord, if I had time, here we go. Where did this all come from? At the meeting where she gave out the Sankofa uh, uh, things for our luggage. I did a sermon entitled, The Miseducation of the AME Church. We have been miseducated. 
We have been deceived and because we've been deceived, we are divided. And because we are divided, then the disruption has come into the very church that God created to bring order to African American people in America, which is why where in the heaven do you think Church of God in Christ got bishops from? Where in heaven do you think that the Baptist got the position bishop from? But you have run it down to the point that you forget that the bishopric is an Episcopal form of government that gave our people order, that made our people educated, that made our people educated in Christ. And we built institutions that our great, great grandparents built. And you and I with our suit wearing St. John wearing self can barely keep open because of the fact that we've been deceived, divided, disrupted, and we need somebody say uh, we need deliverance and when we deny we I moved from last Sunday at Bethel Baptist Church where uh, the black national anthem was written in the basement here in Jacksonville I preached a message has the black church lost its mind and one of the challenges today is because the black church has lost its mind. The AME church had lost its mind because we turn on each other instead of to each other. But when we have a Sankofa moment, then I, you can answer the Jeopardy question. This ain't final Jeopardy yet. The, the answer the question, has the AME church lost its soul? What does it profit a pastor and a church to build a new building when the people around it are poor? What does it profit a pastor to become a bishop and then have folks stand for him or her? And while the people are living homeless on the streets around the very building, that, uh, that houses the 11th district building how in the world we've lost our soul because what does it profit a man or a woman to gain a Mercedes and lose their miracles what does it profit a man or a woman to wear St. John but they don't have the kingdom of God within them and so after self denial you got to have some self discipline that's what Richard Allen and them called holiness that's what the good God from Zion, because we're supposed to be different than the heathen. We're supposed to be different than our oppressor. In fact, King James says, envy thou not thine oppressor and, ha and choose none of its ways. Where has suicide come from? It has come from imitating a society because our grandparents, when white folk were jumping out, out of hallelujah high rises during the depression we were singing this joy I have the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away and now our children and grandchildren in the AME church dress better live better and have more but they have not learned self discipline so I close now with this the thief has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. But when you have a Sankofa movement, you're able to say the answer in Final Jeopardy is J-E-S-U-S. Because Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So whoever stole the money that you're fussing about, Jesus gave it and he can restore it like that if we have a Sankofa movement and a Sankofa moment, miracles will break out at EWU. Miracles will break out all over black America. Mi miracles will break out in America and then we'll be able to say, I've seen the lightning flashing. I've heard the thunder roll. But he promised if I had my Sankofa movement, never to leave us. Never to leave us alone. Thank you very much. It's in your hands.
Let me clean this up. try to write notes because I'm accustomed to responding to lecture by writing notes so I missed a lot of it Bishop <laughs> writing notes and my handwriting looks like I may not let me begin by thanking you for exhibiting what Caesar Clark called emancipatory praxis emancipatory praxis means the ultimate response to God is to inform to engage and to explain to people how to recover power lost in the world. So I want to thank you for that. Zora L. Hurston once said, if you're quiet about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. So one of the things that the bishop said over and over again translates into that. I think that in many ways what you were talking about, even when you quoted Clark, once people know who they are, they will know what to do about their condition. We have anesthetized our mindsets, uh, trying to gather things, as you said. So we accumulate, uh, it's called um, affluenza. We accumulate things, but they're things that are going to pass away quickly. Many of us have nothing that we're leaving to our children because we accumulated things. And what I was taught is you leave your children ideas so then they can do. So I think that when, when I handed out that Sankofa luggage tag, I stressed that history was always in the making. Too many people in the church think history is old that we do annually. We just made history from the time you started talking. That's history. So we have to think about that. And so let me recommend just a couple of things that go with that. Your, your statement about Cone also, uh, some people don't even know who Cecil is, by the way, which I find really hurtful. When I talk to people across the country, they, they think that James Cone started everything, but he was very, his, his brother talked about black theology before he did. If you really want to press the point, Henry McNeil Turner was the first one to ask, is God black? So you need to know that black theology was way back in what we were doing. But one of the things that if you read The Cross and the Lynching Tree, which I think that you probably have, or said I wasn't going to tell nobody, Sometimes as we're entering into that period of time where we have a lot of experience now, was that when I was a child, I spake as a child, James Cone toward the end of his life began to understand that what he learned in Bearden, Arkansas, and what he learned in the AME church, which even when he started talking about black theology, <clears throat> put him out. They didn't want him in because they didn't want to talk about God was black. Right? They didn't want to talk about God was black. They still had the white pictures and the you know, little Sunday school card with the white Jesus. So he was embarrassing them. So he became angry at the church because he was trying to show the church the reflection of who they were, but they wanted a different kind of reflection. But toward the end of his life, then he begins to say, the, the, the ground of my faith is my blackness. The ground of my faith is my mother's and father's in Bearden, Arkansas. The ground of my faith is understanding that we had to work for everything that we had. The ground of my faith is you cannot buy salvation. You cannot have, you can't buy love. That's what he was talking about there. And so the fugitive pedagogy I love uh, that you were talking about from Woodson. Um, education is always about doing. Uh, some of us haven't read a book since we left school. We don't even do the audio books because we think that we've known it. Some preachers have not read a book since they got the degree at seminary. Some lay people skip Sunday school. They haven't read anything. Or they're reading white evangelical literature. So one of the things we stress in research and scholarship is we have hundreds of black scholars that you need to be reading. The reason we're having the Thinking Church Conference is to introduce the AME Church to people in the church that think and do. Uh, the think, um, <laughs> I get all carried away. Uh, the power of the Thinking Church Conference is at the Emory Conference Center May 18th, 19th, and 20th. 
All of the presenters are AME. They're either scholars or practitioners. All of the presenters are AME. And I'm sorry. Yes, Bishop. We would welcome you. Because what I saw today was the Frank Madison read I knew at Shorter. We're there without, without stepping up here. <laughs> um, and it seems that sometimes uh, what, what we're seeing, and I agree with you, is that sometimes we, we, our goal is a promotion and not what we were supposed to do for the people. People enter a space looking for next instead of developing where they are. And I see that not just in churches, I see that when I have students come in, I have students that come into seminary and they're talking about pastoring 5,000 people and they can't spell five or thousand. But, the, but that's, what they, that's what they need to go to do, right? And, and so that kind of this, this, this American consumerism that our value is and how much stuff we have, but as Gardner Taylor used to say, we have a $5 hat and nothing in our head. Right, and so that becomes critically important. I would also, and I'm gonna do this quickly because I know we have lots to do, uh, but you, you had so much, and I was thinking about Prathia Hall's Freedom Faith. Oh, yeah. um, and and Prathia and I had lots of conversations, but when she was talking about the crucible of our faith is a struggle we have in order to do the process of freedom, that it's not one and done. It's not a protest when you see it on the news. It's what you do when the cameras leave. That's the process of freedom. It's not choosing one person as the leader, it's recognizing all of us have to lead someplace because it's easy to knock off one leader. And that's where we fail. When we had lots of people working together as blacks, we were fine, but then when we decided to follow a white structure that said you have one leader, and let me talk about social media a minute, why in the world are we publishing what we're getting ready to do? We will do a selfie, we will do all kinds of stuff, telling the people where we're going to do, what we're going to do, what time we're going to do it, who's going to be the speaker, and it's easy to get to them before they get to you. So we're failing because we're falling into a consumerist mentality and other people's ways of doing things. And that's why we can't have a movement yet because somebody always want to be on the front. They want to be on the flyer of the movement. They want to be on the front of the flyer of the movement. They don't want to do the work in the background, out of the camera. That's where the work gets done. Um, so I'm going to leave with this. Uh, I'm a woman a scholar. That does not mean I hate black men. My husband died seven years ago, and I still love black men. I just want y'all to know that. I just want y'all to know that. This is not about anything against black men. It's recognizing that we have to have black men and women working together, as we had when we came over enslaved, by the way. When we jumped and thought we were white, then we started dividing each other. It was to be fights against each other, right? Then we started borrowing people's companion as if we still had polygamy. You know what I'm saying? Okay, let me go on. Okay. So as a woman, as a womanist scholar, we believe in the wisdom of the elders. We believe that they've been where we're trying to go. That even if they smell funny and can't remember everything, they remember more than you have in your head right now. So we must value our elders and get some information from them. Get some information. When I was running around with a big natural Angela Davis fro and culottes and a gaucho hat, and I was bad. I was black parent all over the place. My grandparents, I did not find out until I was 45 years old, desegregated the library in Sedalia, Missouri, when my mother was eight, because they wanted their children to have books. Their methods were different, but they were more effective than the methods I had. Think about who's been through what you're facing. This is not the first time somebody has tried to erase our history. It's not the first time. It's not the first time people have been killed in the streets. The difference is with social media, you see it faster. But think about the number of people that were killed at the same time Emmett Kill was killed. And we didn't have, we didn't have a casket with them in it. While we're sitting here right now, somebody's dying at the hands of the police. But we also have members of our churches who are police officers, so we can't paint everybody with the same brush. There are some people that are just patently evil. The brothers in Memphis proved that. We gotta stop asking the question, are they black, when they do something. First question, are they black? That shows a little bit of guilt, which means we haven't done the communal thing that Bishop was talking about. All right, so let me, redemptive self-love means that 
we care for ourselves. That means take care of yourself, your body, your mind, your spirit, so then you can be in the movement, because if not, you'll be a toxic asset in the movement, and try to kill it because you'll be jealous of somebody else doing something that you haven't thought about doing. Critical engagement means that we use our brains. Stop letting people say you don't know anything. Stop, just stop, read, yes, but you have ideas. You have ideas, you have experience. Share it, stop trying to get the credit for it. Reverend Boyd, Jeff C. Lincoln Boyd taught me, when I have an idea and people don't want to hear, hear it, I go into the room and drop it where I know somebody has some power more than I do. See, and so I didn't need my name on it, but I saw it take place. So sometimes what you have to do is drop your idea and work back here. And ask yourself, is it more important that I got my name on it or that it's happening in the first place? The other thing helped me as a woman in ministry, Bishop Benton Anderson, when I first made me secretary of everything. And my, my, you know, my black woman self was, I'm, I don't want to be, I don't drink coffee, I'm not bringing y'all coffee, I'm not schlepping stuff for you, I'm not gonna write minutes. He pulled me aside and he said, Teresa, let me say this to you. Nobody listens to the minutes. So when you're sitting in the meeting and you want somebody on the worship committee, slide their name in there. I got more women at a time where they didn't have any on a program, on programs at annual conferences, because I was the secretary. I put the name in, because the, the rest of them are out in the hallway strategizing politics and didn't come in to approve the minutes. God will put you places that you can do some seditious activity. But you gotta move your ego out of the way to do it. All right. Traditional communalism means that God intends for us to be free, but freedom is a movement. And, and Pat, uh, Bishop Reed said, was talking about memory. It's been said that memory is resistance. Forgetting is consent. Memory is resistance, but forgetting is consent. If people can convince you that you never existed, if they can convince you that you know nothing, if they convince you that you came from nobody, that's how you will operate in the world. But if you remember who you are, I think it was in Black Panther that the queen said, show them who you are. And we cheered and we went home and forgot who we were. It doesn't mean we gotta be kings and princes all the time, cause sometimes my grandfather was a mechanic and he was more of a social activist than anybody. All right, and the last point, because I gotta take my seat as they say all the time, and I had it and it was a good point and I lost it so I guess I'm not supposed to say it. Uh, reciprocity. The other part of the Sankofa movement, as Bishop was talking about, is reciprocity, which means that we are able to share with each other. I, as I travel around to churches, not just AME churches, I travel around the world, people that were generous at one time have become the most selfish people I've ever seen because of fear, because of fear. And so we have to think about how we can share something. My grandmother's favorite song that I used to sing was if I can help somebody then my living will not be in vain. There are too many people whose living's in vain because they become selfish and only promote themselves wow. and their church and their family and their ideas instead of sharing with other people. And that's what I think part of your movement was talking about, Bishop, and I think I'm gonna stop there because I think I have to stop there. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. I, I done lost my phone. Is that my phone over there, Doc? It's in the pulpit up here? Elder, would you mind getting it for me, please? I'm old. You're a young man. It's time now for us to get ready to go. I'm going to ask if I could get a big basket uh, from the finance team uh, or the host pastor. I'm not going to thank you so much, Elder. Doesn't he have a sharp suit on? I'm not. Bishop, 
we didn't have time for questions. I want two of our members. One, I want you to pray for Reverend Charles, I believe it's Jones, Jr., uh, senior and junior. I talked to Junior this morning, had prayer with him. Uh, his mother passed, his father's wife. They've been married over 50 years. Please remember the Jones family. Please remember Reverend Ronnie Clark and Reverend Price. Uh, they leave for Africa in the morning. Are there any other prayer requests before we go? All right. Yes, ma'am. Minister, Reverend Vivian Grant had a stroke. Let us pray for her healing. J.O. Williams, presiding elder J.O. Williams. We want to pray for elder Williams. And who else? And yes, Dr. Cook is uh, recovering from a double, uh, was it double or single knee surgery? He had just won it this time. And so I'm not going to ask for any set amount. You know whether you gave $100 in the last offering or whether you said I'm going to give 50 this time or 50 the next. But here's one of the things I learned. If you give the best, if everybody gives the best that they have, a hundred may not be your best. Fifty may not be your best. I'm just asking every person, you receive today what normally from both uh, Dr. Uh, Teresa Fry Brown and your bishop that at a school would cost anywhere from $10,000 and above. And it wouldn't be you have to ask for it and Cornell and then get fifty to 60000 from the school. We're the only people that want to complain about something for nothing. I don't know if he's on the um, uh, May conference, but right here in this district, we have a PhD. We have many PhDs, but we have a PhD who did a book on my paraphrase, uh, why the African Methodist Episcopal Church was not African and how we took the name, but we took white evangelical theology and we thought our African brothers and sisters were heathens, all right? And so I want you to get the best offering you have. Uh, I'm going to give electronically uh, so, so I can have some money in my pocket when I decide to eat lunch. And Mavis, everybody stand with your offering. And you don't have to come in any kind of way. And if you're going to put it, just hit the, uh, where are those papers I had? They're not in my Bible. Just come on and bring it. Just come on and bring your offering. All right, thank you, sir. Mm hmm I thought I did. I stuck it. How you doing, Doc? Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Reverend Roy. Thank you for take, taking prayer. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Lemon. Did you call my wife and let her know? Keep me out of the living room. That's where she, that's, thank you, Doc. That's where she puts me when I don't do what she tells me. Thank you, Doc. She puts me in the living room. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is everybody who's going to give giving? Dr. Williams, how you doing? Good to see you. How you doing, sir? Thank you. How you doing, man? Good to see you. Thank you, doctor. 
Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Finance Committee, let us stand. Bishop, I had questions. Sis needs to get to the airport and get some rest. Bishop, we'll see you all tonight at the, uh, some of you tonight at the Black Heritage Night. I'll see you tomorrow, part of it. I'll be there service Sunday. Hope to see you. Any announcements, son? No, no, sir. Is uh, Sister Tamika here? She just stepped out. I think, I think she's right there. She has just a couple of announcements regarding. Let's give our 11th Episcopal District uh, YPD Director a hand clap of praise as she comes. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. To Bishop and Supervisor, to Ms. Laura Steen Lemon, our WMS Episcopal President, Alexis Robinson, the current South YPD President, I would like to invite you. We, we excited. We excited to invite you to the 36th Annual Black Heritage Weekend where the YPDers of the 11th Episcopal District declares that the race isn't finished and the marathon continues. We want you all to join us tonight to celebrate our black heritage. Registration starts at 3.30 p.m. and then we will have a night of praise. Tomorrow registration starts at 8. We have our competitions and then we have our infamous step show so you can't miss it. And then Sunday morning we have our worship service where we close out Black Heritage Weekend. And it's our Sankofa worship service. So we want you to come and bring Lolly Dotty and some of everybody. Okay, God bless you. Let us stand. Thank you. Give them a big hand. Love you all too. In the old church, and I first heard this in the 5th District when my father was pastor at St. James, St. Louis, nobody could sing like AMEs. God be with you. Till we meet again. And one of the reasons I don't understand the old I get why we fight with each other like we do. This may be the last time we see each other. And when we fight like cats and dogs, brother, my, my, my. And so in Kemet, ancient black Egypt, they talked about deep thought. And Sankofa is about deep, righteous feelings, deep, righteous thought, and deep, righteous behavior. And the reason we stopped saying, may the Lord watch between me and thee, if you were of a certain generation, all hear me, Meetings closed with that until we realized that that was a prayer between two family members that had become enemies. And so may deep feeling, righteous feeling, righteous thought, and righteous behavior overcome you. May you raise your hand now where there's sickness, Holy Spirit heal. Where there is sick-mindedness, Holy Spirit, release the mind of Christ. Where evil is seeking to sneak into our hearts, create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. And now God said to Moses, Moses said to Aaron, Richard Allen said to Jerina Lee, and they said to the people of God, may the Lord bless you on this Founders Day and Black Heritage Weekend. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face smile upon you. And may the Lord give you these three things that the world cannot give. Peace, power, and true prosperity. In Jesus' name and all the people of God said, amen. amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a good one.